Hello, my name is Jason Kendall. Welcome to yet another one of my introductory astronomy lectures. Last time we did a little bit of a side diversion over to the nature of equations and things, and I provided a bunch of references. But really, to finish off the whole thing, we need to start where we began. If we go all the way back to Aristotle and the debate of the ancient Greeks about who's in the center, the sun is at the center of the cosmos, or is it the earth that's the center? And this was a subject of debate for centuries. So really, this deserves its complete answer as to what the resolution of the whole thing is. All right, so is the earth actually moving and do we have actual evidence there too? Yes, we do. Simple, uh, simple statement, but let's actually show you the measurements that we're talking about. All right, so uh, the big bugaboo for everyone was parallax. If the earth was moving around the sun, there must be parallax. And even after Newton published his Principia, the laws of gravity, the laws of motion, the uh, parallax still had not been observed. So it was an area of active research. In 1674, Robert Hooke tried to do so with uh, Gamma Draconis, which is a bright star in the constellation Draco, which is easily measured in London because it passes straight overhead. And so what he tried to do is he tried to actually see the parallax of that star, and he, he wasn't entirely successful. So, but he at least paved the way. And in 1725, James Bradley set up a special telescope that was basically inside a big chimney, um, and he hunted for the parallax of Gamma Draconis, because he was also in London, he wanted to make sure he could actually do this, and he actually then also looked at other stars as well that had passed through his telescope, because it was a fixed point telescope, and he found you know, another star, 35 Camelo Pardalis, which, another, which is another star that passed through the field of view. He did not find the parallax. However, he found something else that was even stranger. He made, because he was trying to find parallax, he was trying to find the annual motion, the annual change of the position of a star as the Earth was going around. So every star should have the same kind of parallactic motion if it's in the same direction of the sky. But what he found was that Gamma Draconis had this very strange motion. Well, over the course of a year, it would drift a little bit southward and then drift back to center and then drift a little bit northward and then back. And this drifting was because it's initially he thought it was parallax, but if he waited a certain period of time for the star 35 Camelopardalis to actually go come also into view, he found at the same exact time, maybe a few hours later so he could get into view, that Camelopardalis actually at the same time that that uh, 35 Camelopardalis Camelopardalis, which I'll call 35 Cam from now on for making it easier, and Gamma Drac for the other one, was actually drifting the other way exactly at the same time. So as, as, as uh, Gamma Draconis was drifting southward in the telescope as they were hunting for parallax, 35 Cam was drifting northward, but just by a little bit, not as much. And they actually swapped places. Now this was really strange because they like, well, this can't be affected by parallax either, so maybe it's something in the sky, Maybe I've got some problem with my telescope. But what ended up being is that in 1728, they actually discovered the motion of the Earth in the following way. This is called stellar aberration. And we can think about it in, this, in the following way. The shift that they saw with Gamma Draconis and 35 Camelopardalis, with Gamma Draconis being the biggest effect, was the idea that imagine your telescope is a long tube. And what you want to do is you want to hold the tube in such a way that, let's say you want to run in the rain. So you're going to go running with a tube in the rain and your goal is running in the rain is to make the drops as they're falling, as you're running with the tube, not hit the sides of the inside of the tube, but only the bottom of the tube. You don't want the sides of the inside wet. You only want the bottom. So as you run in the rain, the rain's coming straight down. As you run, you've got to tilt the tube slightly so that as the rain falls in the tube, the tube, pass it, the tube doesn't touch the raindrop as it moves. Now, if the tube's still, you could just hold it right in place and go thump, 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 thump right to the bottom and not hit the sides. But the moves, tube is moving to the side. As the rain comes into the tube, it'll hit the side before it gets to the bottom. So you have to tilt the tube slightly. Now, 
if the telescope is already tilted, then what you find is that, wait a second, the tilt of the telescope happens because you have to change the position you're looking for to center it up slightly, because as the Earth moves, it takes the telescope with it. And over the short period of time that the light takes to travel along the length of the telescope tube, the Earth moves and pulls the telescope with it. So you have to adjust for that in order to center up the object inside of your field of view. So the apparent position of the star changes because it changes where it lands on the detector at the back of the telescope. So the telescope moves, the light falls down like a ray, and instead of hitting the bottom of the telescope, which would mean where your detector is, it might hit the side. So you have to adjust, the, you have to literally change the angle of the telescope in order to keep the star centered. And that can only happen if the telescope is moving. So if we know that the laboratory is, has a telescope that's fixed with respect to the Earth, then in order, in order for this change in position to be taken into account of because of this movement, like trying to, trying to get the, catch raindrops in a bucket and not get the sides of the inside of the bucket wet, then the telescope must be moving to a certain given direction. And the change in north-south direction is a result of the position of the Earth's direction of motion at the time of observation that, that James Bradley was doing this. And if you wait a few hours later, the Earth is going in a slightly different direction because of the rotation of the Earth. And we actually then discovered the motion of the Earth through space. And this motion is called stellar aberration. Basically, you have to point the telescope in a different direction to take into account the fact that the Earth is moving. Another way to look at it is, if you're driving into a snowstorm, the snowflakes appear to be coming at you straight on. Now, you know that they might be coming straight down. Maybe it's a perfectly still night and the snow is coming straight down or the rain's coming straight down. But when you're driving into it, it appears to be coming towards you. So you'd have you, it, so that's an effect of the change of position of the angle that it's coming is a result of your motion, not the motion of the star. So as the car moves through the snowstorm, the snow appears to be coming tw towards you even though in reality, if you were on the side of the road watching the car go by, the snow would be coming nice and straight down. So what we find then is that the discovery of the motion of the Earth through space was done in 1725 as a result of looking for stellar parallax. All right, so that was a very difficult thing. But now let's actually keep going with this. In 1791, a, an Italian uh, mathematician by the name of Guglielmini actually measured the Coriolis effect. So if you can either have the Earth going through space, but is it rotating on its axis? Is it actually rotating? And if it is rotating, then yes, as, then as something that's dropped off a tower should deflect. Or if something is shot out of a cannon northward, it should deflect. So there was a prediction based if the Earth's rotating, how much deflection there would be if you dropped it, say, 30 meters down a spiral staircase or down a, down a tower, what's the deflection that happens when you drop something? And Guglielmini did this thing. He tested a 29-meter drop inside a tower at the University of Bologna. And what he found was that there was a 4-millimeter deflection that always occurred to the east as expected by, by, um, it was expected by, by Coriolis effects. So he discovered the Coriolis effect in 1791, thus proving the Earth rotating. Now we can use a Foucault pendulum, and you can actually make a pendulum go, and the pendulum will always stay in the plane that it goes and slowly rotate around the axis of, of the plane of rotation as the Earth rotates. Um, it's another way to detect it. The other way is to go up in space and see the, the Earth rotating. That's another way. So the Earth's rotation can be measured on the ground using the deflection of things also, uh, this was something that had to be taken into account in the Second World War, because as people had very long guns, you could shoot, the Navy could shoot these long shells many miles. As they shot northward, the shell would deflect. And so they had to take into account the Coriolis effect due to the flight of the projectile, the flight of the, 
the flight of the bullet, the flight of the, uh, the flight of the projectile as it was going towards the enemy ship. And so you had to actually take that into account by giving the distance, how much deflection it would be, and whether you're pointing straight north, straight south, a little more east, a little more west. So that had to be calculated so you'd actually hit your target because the shot of the shells was so incredibly far but they had to actually take the account into, into account of Coriolis effects in the Second World War. So, but the first detection of Coriolis was in 1791. Well, what about parallax? Parallax was kind of the gold standard for Aristotle. It wasn't detected. Tycho Brahe said it wasn't something it could discover. So how did people actually find that? Well, there was a star, there is a star named 61 Cygni, which is a binary star in the constellation Cygnus that passes overhead in the summertime for us. And it's a good candidate for looking for parallax because we, it's got a very large proper motion. The proper motion of it scoots it across the sky. Proper motion, if you remember, is the apparent change in position with respect to the background stars due to the actual motion of the star through space. So pro proper motion makes it look like it's going across the celestial sphere. And that proper motion, if it's large, that means it's got to be close. So people are, ah, it's a close star. We, maybe we can get its parallax. And so in 1838, Friedrich Wilhelm Bessel measured it, measured its parallax to be 0.285 arc seconds, which works out to be about three and a half parsecs or about 11.4 light years. So the very first parallax that was discovered was less than an arc second, it was a quarter of an arc second. It's an incredibly difficult measurement and it took until 1838 for someone to develop it. So we really can't fault Aristotle or Tycho Brahe or anybody else who used the argument that parallax does not, it did not occur to shoot down the idea that the sun was at the set, that the sun was at the center because parallax was an extremely difficult thing to measure. Also, Coriolis effect was something that Aristotle knew about, and he couldn't detect it. But remember, it took until 1791 for someone to be able to make a tower that's over 30 meters high, that's 100 feet, and drop something, and then be able to measure the accuracy of the, in, of the drop to within a millimeter. So you can see a deflection of four millimeters as something drops 29 meters. That's hard to do. Wouldn't expect the Aristotle and his team or anybody to be able to do that until we could actually isolate things and do better with technology. Basically, 1791 technology was needed, which is not a lot, but just enough. And in 1725, the de de detection of the Earth's orbit, the Earth's motion through space, was done by looking, was done by hunting for parallax, but instead discovered stellar aberration, which is the effect of having to move your telescope in a different way in order to center the object, given where the Earth's orbit is around the sun. So if the Earth's orbiting around the sun, then the speed with which it's going in the direction towards that star is ch changes the direction you have to look inside the telescope. And so these are very small, small measurements to make. They're very difficult. And so we cannot fault the ancients for not doing that. And we can also, so that what that meant is, is that Aristotle wasn't wrong. What he was, was he didn't have the technology to see it. And so these long arguments against the Earth being moving through space took a long time in order for the technology to catch up so that you actually see them. Stellar aberration is even a very difficult thing to measure. So is parallax. So is, um, so is Coriolis effects. These things are hard to measure. So the initial measurements were, were extremely important to do. So once we finally did that, we can now say that yes, the Earth does rotate. And because of the Coriolis effect that is seen to happen when we shoot projectiles a long distance, north or south. We also see it when you drop something. The Coriolis effect was predicted, but it's extremely difficult to measure. And so as you drop something, a very high effect, the Coriolis effect should occur. And it's a course of four millimeters over 20, a 30, 30, mil, 30 meter drop. It's very hard to measure. And then parallax was finally observed to prove that the Earth changes its position around the Sun and not the Sun around the Earth. So people that think that the Earth is flat, people that think that the Earth is at the center, they're dead wrong and they're wrong because we can measure the things to actually be true. And they're measured on the surface of the Earth and these measurements apply to the cosmos. That is the power of this method of inquiry that we call science.
the method of inquiry we call science, says, give me your idea, give me your prediction, I'll see if it's true. If your prediction is falsified, if, if I make a measurement that falsifies your prediction, then your idea is false. So, but the thing is, is that people didn't have the ability to do certain kinds of measurements until very much later. So we then get to a point where there's a bunch of people who have the capacity, ability, and time, and technology in order to accomplish a task of measurement, and then we have a group of people that can then establish what that is. And that's kind of the story of modern science. Modern science veers away from logical constructs that can be talked about relatively quickly and it goes into a detailed measurements that then support ideas that are very that are tricky to get a hold of. So these I, the a reason I brought I went with such a long time about this whole idea about does the earth move is that when we talk about how old the sun, the sun is and what will the sun become when it's ancient and dies away? What is a black hole? What's a neutron star? How do we know the age of the cosmos? How do we know how big the galaxy is? These are extraordinarily difficult measurements to make. But the key is, is that when Bessel made his measurement, he told people how to do it, and people have replicated that measurement. And when Guglielmini made his measurement of the Coriolis force, he told people how he did it, and people replicated it. And when James Bradley did his, uh, published it in 1728 of exactly how uh, the, the uh, the, uh, the stellar aberration worked. He published it and told people how to take it into account. So that's the difference. People make measurements in science in order not to say, hey, this is this really cool thing I've discovered. They make the measurements to say, I know that I have made, I might have gone wrong. Show me where I made my measurement wrong. Show me where my ideas are wrong. Because this is my idea. And here's my prediction with this idea. Here's my measurement. Does it fit the I does it fit that? And uh, maybe I did some bad measurement. Please go check. The point of make, announcing a measurement isn't that you're supposed to say, well, it's done now. I'm the person. I'm the authority. No, you make a measurement so that other people can go check you. And that's the key to science. It says, I know I could have made a mistake. This supports that idea. This refutes that idea. It supports or refutes some idea. Please go check. And here's how I did it. So here's what I here's what I hope you can do too, so you can replicate my results. That's the essence of science. And that's what grew from Aristotle to Ptolemy. That's what created the incredible difficulties of the Renaissance and the, and the transition out of medieval thinking into Renaissance thinking, into modern science, and everything else that we're going to be talking about for the rest of this course, details, ideas, just like that, that start from these really hard-won concepts. And now we run with them, where we say, here's my measurement, and look at this amazing result we got. And astronomy is probably has some of the most amazing results and some of the most amazing measurements of all of human history. And we'll talk more about those soon. See you next time.